I raved about how wonderful and creative and artistic and innovative my students are. So he agreed to come and meet you all and share about his story and his work as a designer and architect and all the innovative things that he's done. So it's a real treat to have you here today, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the main thing that I want you guys to take away from this today is that being young and inexperienced is actually a competitive advantage. And everything I've done in business has been built upon that idea. So if you think about it right now, uh, you're learning from people that are older than you. But there's probably a whole bunch of things that you guys know much better than them, specifically relating to the internet, media, and technology. Do you, I would assume all of you know how to use social media to a greater extent than your parents? Yes. Of course. <laughs> right? Now, is social media an inconsequential or non-lucrative business? I mean, Facebook is easily one of the most powerful companies in the world. And it's something that you know how to use better than your parents. Am I saying anything not true? So that's what my whole career has been built upon, is I'm really impatient. I don't want to wait. I don't want to learn from people that are older than me. I want to go faster than them and get ahead of them. And that's why being young is an advantage if you know when to listen and when not to listen. Uh, there's times when, uh, for specific knowledge, especially when it comes to making something that's dangerous, like in our case, like wiring a solar powered house that could have electrocuted us, you might want to listen a little bit. But where I wasn't going to ever listen was in people telling me how to spread ideas because I was like, you're older than me, you barely know how to use email, uh, you don't have a website. So I'm going to disregard everything you say in that specific capacity. So already there's a generation gap between you guys and myself. Uh, I'm still much more comfortable with Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, whereas if you look at all the demographics, the younger generations is more familiar with Vine and Snapchat and things like that. So again, these are billion dollar industries of which you can uh, that you can use not just to build a career around, but to augment any career that you might be doing, even if it's a traditional one. So keep that in mind as we go through these things, and I'll try to sort of highlight some of the moments uh, in my life where that kind of philosophy has helped me. All right, need a stretch. So, talking first, we'll, we'll skip right to college. Uh, the, that's when the, the sort of entrepreneurial activities were started. Now, I studied architecture. Architecture is all right. My professors, I think the youngest professor I had was, was 30. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from them. Uh, but one of the things that they weren't really teaching at that time was anything about sustainability, global warming, or solar panels. It's kind of hard to believe now because that's a really big topic in school. But the world's changing fast, right? So even all the way back in just 11 or 12 years ago, these things now, which are a major part of every architecture curriculum, there was not a single class related to sustainability. So, uh, we, you know, at first we petitioned our, our faculty, uh, but they're like, okay, we'll try to do something. And then we're like, well, screw that, we'll just, we'll just figure it out on our own. So one of the fellow, uh, I think it was when I was like a sophomore, uh, sophomore or junior, I got 70 other students from uh, Cornell, and we built a team, and we entered a design competition to design and build a completely solar-powered house. So this is the house we built. It's about 700 square feet. It had, it's completely powered by solar panels. Um, I only almost nearly electrocuted myself twice, but somehow survived. Um, Everything that powers the house, all the hot water, all the electricity, all comes from the sun. Uh, it has even produced enough power to power an electric car. And not only did we design it ourselves, we built it. Uh, we thought about all the things that made sense to us. It never made sense to me that there was like these big gardens and then people would go and buy food. Why can't the garden be both ornamental and you can also eat it? So we worked with students from landscape architecture and horticulture to design a completely edible garden. Even the flowers were edible. Uh, we designed grass couches. Uh, 
because we thought if we're going to use grass, it actually uses up a ton of water and isn't really productive other than in its more environmental capacity. It is nice to sit on. So we said, well, let's use less of it. But where we do use it, let's use it in a more strategic way. We built all of the furniture out of bamboo. Bamboo grows really fast, so it has a faster cycle, which means it's less harmful than uh, traditional wood for building stuff. And right away, right after, while we were in college, we were already planning for our next step. Because normally in something like architecture, you go and you work for somebody else for 10 years before you start your own thing. I was like, 10 years? That's, that's way too long. I don't want to work for anyone else. I want to do things exactly the way I want to do it, and I want to go as fast as I possibly can. So we said, in college, we don't have a lot of bills, right? Everything's taken care of. So let's plan the business now so that we're ahead of the curve while everyone else is just trying to figure out how to pay rent and do all these things. We're already laying the foundation for our business. So we took advantage of the free time we had in the previous stage to get ahead in the next stage. So at the time, we knew that again, sustainability, energy efficiency, solar power, all these things were going to be big. And it wasn't, it wasn't a secret, right? Like it was, it was obvious. But why, why weren't the sort of, the more experienced architects sort of figuring out how to do this already? Well, the answer is because they already had their jobs. They were already busy. They had their families. They had more distractions. When you're in college, you're not married, you don't have kids normally, uh, you have more free time to get ahead of the people that are complacent and ahead of you. So we focused spe uh, specifically on sustainability, and right away we started designing, right out of college, uh, solar-powered homes like this. This is on Cape Cod, <coughs> in a little town called Turo. Uh, it's completely solar-powered. It actually even has these giant coils that go into the earth that actually use the, the more stable temperature of deep inside the earth to sort of balance out the temperature of the home when it's really cold or really hot outside. Um, so we won a lot of awards, got started to get fit, uh, published in magazines, but then we started seeing sort of a challenge that wasn't what we wanted, right? So we were getting a lot of recognition, doing cool stuff, uh, getting more and more uh, wealthier and wealthier clients, but we're only serving like 20 to 30 people a year. And that's kind of cool, making good money, could do whatever we wanted, but we wanted to have a bigger impact. Uh, so we tried to do things that were just more sort of humanitarianly minded. Uh, this is a project we did uh, to help rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we designed affordable houses that were all solar powered. Uh, we thought about better ways on like small lots to create more activities. You ever like drive by like a suburban street and it's just all this space in the lawn but nobody there? And it's like they're paying for that space but they're not using it. Terrible design, absolutely terrible. So we thought that in these places, especially where people didn't have a lot of property, less design and better, less design an outdoor living room. So that as you're walking home, it's like people sort of hanging out on the porch, it's more activated and interactive. Uh, and when we started thinking about we weren't satisfied with 30 homes a year. I mean, we're probably a little bit arrogant. Uh, we said, we want to be doing thousands and thousands of homes a year. But we would have to, for that, we would have had to hire, in our traditional architecture model, thousands and thousands of employees to do that. So we looked at actually where people got their designs and discovered that uh, a lot of them came from something called stock house plans. So 30% of all the homes in America came from these just drawings, these big, terrible drawings that were about uh, two feet by three feet, and people would pay for them. So what we did, get the through, is we made a website where rather than selling these designs, we gave them away for free. We basically like Netflix for design. Subscription model, produce a bunch of content, get ahead. And we got the idea from exactly from companies like Netflix, because we knew that we were actually paying attention to the things that we liked and that made sense. And if you look at like young people that are starting businesses and doing cool stuff now, it's because they're saying like, huh, I really like Uber. I bet you we could do Uber for this thing or this thing. And that's something where people that are, you okay? You need a glass of water or anything? <laughs> uh, because we were sort of in the moment and using these things every day, we took them seriously. And whereas the mindset for older people
people tends to be, this is new, is this going away? As you get older, you become more and more cynical and more and more sort of doubtful of new things. When you're younger, you're sort of constantly filtering them through all your friends and sort of, you know what's, what's sort of going to work and what isn't. Uh, young people knew that MySpace was dying way before older people did, right? And then some very imprudent old people spent way too much money to buy my, MySpace and then they bought it for like three or four billion and they ended up selling it for like a hundredth of that. Because they didn't see that trend that was obvious to people at that time that were your age. So, we said, well, this is where media is going. So let's do this. Next. We created this site called Free Green. And within one year, we became the largest supplier of home designs in the country. And we knew that like traditional architects did 2D drawings. That's fine, but not exactly engaging for somebody that hasn't studied architecture. So we said, it should be more like a video game. So you can actually take tours through the houses. You can switch on different things, switch out different materials. And this is already really dated. This is like six or seven years old. And what it took a lot of hours to do this, to do the same kind of stuff now, way faster. 3D modeling software has gotten that much better. Uh, we did houses and designs of all different styles. And what was interesting, as we built a lot of users, is we thought that we were just doing one thing. We thought we were just doing architecture and spreading design. But we were actually creating something that was really valuable. What industry outside of architecture do you think was interested in the sort of 3D files that we were creating? Any ideas? Designers, what else? Who here has done any sort of 3D modeling? Anyone? What can you do with 3D modeling? What? Customize things, right? What else? What do you see them on in like sort of media? Animations, video games, things like that, right? So what we found is that there's more and more people making video games, and not just for consoles, but for apps and for people trying to make animations. <coughs> so these 3D models, this sort of generic digital type of media, could be used by all different industries. So we were able to create ways to sort of license these things that we thought were just good for architecture to all sorts of other different ways and make money off of those too. 3D modeling is probably one of the most important things you guys can learn right now. Because it really applies to anything, even if you don't want to be a designer, right? So I recently did a, I had an idea for, you know what, who here knows what Kickstarter is? Yeah, okay cool. If you can 3D model and you have an idea for a product, that's pretty much, and you know how to use iMovie and take somewhat decent photos, you can do a Kickstarter campaign. Those are the only tools I needed to do a Kickstarter campaign. I had an idea for a product. I could 3D model it. I don't have a factory that can produce it. But once I have a 3D model, I can send it to a thousand different factories and get them to do a price quote. As soon as I get a price quote, I can put it up on the Kickstarter, and then I can, it's just up to my sort of ability to promote it on social media to make a ton of money. It's that fast. So if you can 3D model, you can speak in the language of manufacturing and to factories anywhere in the world. Yes? And what do you use to 3D doesn't matter. It just matters to the generic price. Like what, uh, I use Autodesk stuff because they're a sponsor. Um, but there's, there's tons of stuff. The other awesome stuff, oh, you guys have a really awesome thing is that uh, Autodesk is making their, most of their software free, especially for students. Uh, so if, any of you who had free time, I would suggest learning Autodesk Fusion. It's sort of browser-based, so you can just go into the browser, type in Autodesk Fusion, download it, tons of tutorials on YouTube, and it'll help you no matter what you want to do. Even if you decide you want to be a uh, study business and just focus on uh, strictly business stuff and never want to design anything, it can help you make better presentations that stand out. It can help you if you're ever in business and you want to sort of uh, hire someone to design something. It allows you to see more about the design. You don't have to rely on just seeing it in a JPEG image. You can actually spin it around in 3D and have more quality control. If you want to make video games, it's the basis for that. If you want to make movies, it's the basis for that. If you want to just make better Instagram com uh, content for yourself or Vine videos, you can do Vines. You 
dead now. Uh, it can let you do that. It gives you a competitive advantage for anything in media. A lot of people can take selfies, a lot of people can take photos, some people can even edit video. Way fewer people can do sort of 3D modeling. But that 3D modeling stuff can not only inform the physical world, it can also just make your media content better. To make better media content, you can use that for your own amusement, you can use it to get more followers, you can use it for pretty much whatever you want. So, it's one of the things where sometimes when you think you know what you're doing, uh, you're actually creating value and opportunities a lot of other ways. Which is why it's not a good idea, in my opinion, to wait for like the most obvious thing. It's always a good idea to focus on building skills, even if you don't know what you want to do with them. Because the skills are going to be universal, the specific knowledge is not. I don't really practice architecture anymore. Uh, but I still use the 3D modeling skills, I still use the basic design skills, I still use the communication skills on a daily basis. So, some of my investment into my architectural education could see it as sort of a waste because I don't focus on my building code anymore and things like that. But all that tells me is, uh, if I'm learning something now, I <coughs> focus on the skill sets and not the specific knowledge. That I can always use a reference source to look up. Scroll ahead to something interesting. I think some of you have seen the TED talk, so I'll scroll past that. This was our sort of first uh, breakout video. So I had a bet with one of my friends uh, who's a furniture designer, and he said it was impossible to make affordable American made furniture around the US, that we couldn't compete with the lower labor costs of China and Mexico. So I made a YouTube video and won the bet by getting a thousand people uh, from all, pretty much, I think this project's been built on six different continents. Uh, I published this YouTube video. It didn't go viral, it didn't get millions of views right away, but it got hundreds of thousands of views. But what was more interesting is that a lot of people actually built it because it was so easy. So, it only cost about $5 to build, which is cheaper than something at Ikea. And so here I was able to win the bet because he thought it would be impossible for me without factories, trucks, shipping logistics, and all these things to make something that was more affordable than Ikea. But again, he was forgetting the obvious thing which you guys probably know better than most people is that if anybody wants to learn how to do anything now, they are probably searching on YouTube to see if somebody made a video on how to do it. Um, and we have people around the world sort of start posting pictures on Instagram of the uh, stools that they make. Now what was awesome about this is when you have thousands of people taking your idea and then making their version of it, a lot of them are going to figure out things that you didn't realize. So in my case, I got a ton of feedback about ways to make it better, how to make the stool more stable, uh, how to make different variations aesthetically. So now I sort of, even just off of that one YouTube video, I was able to develop a business. So I was able to go from an idea right to millions of people on YouTube. And does anyone know how YouTube works? Like people like PewDiePie and these big YouTubers, how they make money? Yeah. They make money off their views. Right. So how much, how much do you think they make for a thousand views? $1. Yeah, it's about one to three dollars, depending on what their audience is. That's not a lot of money, right? So it's like you need like hundreds of millions of views. So I think right now we're doing about one to two million views a month. So that only means we're getting about anywhere from like two to three thousand dollars a month. That's okay. I mean, it's passive income. Even if we stopped producing any videos, we'd still get that two to three thousand dollars a month just doing nothing, which is nice. But who's getting most of the money? It's Google. That's why Google is Google. Because they know how to sort of set up the thing so that it's easy for you to do it, but they're going to take most of the money. So I wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, and so I started talking to brands like Home Depot, Ryobi, and things like that. I said, when you guys make a commercial, how much money do you normally spend on a commercial? So when you see something on like local television, like regional television, television that has commercials that are only shown in the New England area, how much do you think it costs to make a 30 second commercial? Yes? What? 
10,000? What do you think? 30? Who thinks higher? Raise your hand if you think it's higher. How much do you think they spend on a Super Bowl commercial? So for regional commercials for a big brand, it could be anywhere from $100,000 to $200,000. And for a national commercial, it could easily be uh, $600,000 to well into the millions. And what did they get for that? They get a 30 second video that nobody wants to watch unless they pay someone to put it on their airtime. Um, so, I knew that the money, getting the few cents per view from YouTube didn't make a lot of sense when these brands were paying so much just to get the video themselves. So I started charging the brands a fee to put their products into the videos before it. And then I would give them a copy of the video and they could do that. So that way we were able to make about 10 to 20 times more than we were just from uh, Google. Did anyone ever been to buzzfeed.com? Right? So BuzzFeed has to, they have to, someone has to write all those articles and post them and collect the images and upload them to the web. And they're constantly posting more and more articles and they have a big audience. So if a brand goes to them and says, hey, we want to, we want to put our products onto your page right into the articles, they'll okay, no, 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 you've got to pay us to do that. But I know as a media producer that all their editors are under a ton of pressure to put out the content. Everyone on the internet just talks about content, content, content. Because uh, they know that we're always on our phones, we're always on our laptops, we're always looking for more things to consume. So they have to produce so much. So a lot of these editors, they have to produce two or three posts a day. So they have to collect photos, edit those photos, and write basically three to four 500 word essays a day. It's a lot of homework. Uh, so if I come to them and say, hey, I have something already written, all the images are edited. You can just slide it right into your website and it's all ready to go. They're like, thank you. And I tell them, oh, and by the way, a few of my clients are sort of have their stuff packaged in there. So now what I'm able to do is not only make the commercial for way less than what some people would get from someone else, I can give them the airtime for free. And this is something you, you don't learn in college. This is something you strictly learn by just looking around you and seeing the way the world works, right? This seems like a pretty good school. I know you got some excellent faculty. Uh, some of you go to college, some of you won't probably. I'll try to guess later who's who. <laughs> um, but uh, you'll be bombarded by lots of information that will be really useful and specific. But don't forget to collect the information that's already obvious and right around you. Because there's so many people that, when, that are, when I talk to people my own age, that are unhappy with their job, that feel like they don't have a lot of creative options in life, they'll be like, oh, what you're doing is so obvious. Like, I can't believe more people haven't done that. And it's because most people look directly ahead of them. They look at what they're being told, which is good. Uh, they're thinking about how they don't like what they're being told and how they want to just escape and do something else. That's OK, too. But when you're sort of escaping and you want to get away from what you're being told and do something else, Make sure you're actually extracting some value for that so it's not just pure escapism, but it's actually giving you another path that can either, you can mesh it to with what you're learning in school or sort of create something specifically for yourself. How are we doing on time? Good. All right, we'll cruise a little through more. So this is what I'm sort of doing right now, producing, uh, designing things. I've always liked playing with Legos. I've always wanted to do something that was sort of part physical and part digital. Uh, if I was sitting just at a computer editing video, I think I'd get a little bored. I like the sort of spending about 50-50 in the workshop versus uh, doing computer stuff. So me and my team, we just go to Home Depot, we collect a bunch of materials, we design and build different pieces of furniture. Uh, we make things out of recycled things, we make things out of new things, and publish that content. This is a desk I made for my sister. Oh, this is kind of cool. Have you guys used 3D printers? Has anyone? Yes. Yeah. Was it easy to use or? No. no. Fast or slow? They almost slow. Right. Yeah. People that like it's funny. Like uh, I've always thought 
I would hear these people talk about 3D printers in college. And these people would give lectures and say how in the future, nobody's going to buy anything. People are just going to uh, download 3D files and then just print them on their home computer. And I was like, eh, I don't think so. Right? Because we've had, how long, how long has 2D printers been around for? When, how old do you think inkjet printers are? Yeah, probably about 20 or 30 years, for consumers at least. Has anyone ever like downloaded a PDF and then printed a whole book and then glued it together rather than just buy it from Amazon? Why not? Too time consuming, right? And the quality would be terrible. Uh, the printer would jam, right? So everyone was talking about five or six years ago about 3D printers. Oh, 3D printing is the future. Now we think that the idea of sharing design that can then be made anywhere in the world is pretty interesting. That's a cool concept. Relying on a janky machine that's basically a hot glue gun that moves, not that cool. So we said, well, what's the actual simpler way to do it? And we said, well, 2D printers work better than 3D printers and are a lot faster. So we actually would design, we use 3D software to design 2D templates. So in this case, these PDFs, so you can download them, print them on your inkjet printer, cut along the cut lines, fold along the fold lines, and you can make molds if you then pour concrete or wax into. So we kept making more and more of these templates so that people could download them anywhere and then make objects. Uh, and it was kind of cool because it's essentially 3D printing. It's just 3D printing with machines that have already been developed to the point where they actually work. That's not to say 3D printing isn't interesting, because I do still use it. I just use it more for prototyping than for production. This is sort of a fun, let's see if we can not make the same sound this time. Oh yeah. So this is a, sometimes I don't want to model stuff on computers just because, I don't know, eyes are tired, I feel like doing it. So one of the ways that I'll actually prototype things is I'll use Legos, probably no barrier to entry to using Legos, pretty much anyone can build with them. And we'd actually use them to make molds for concrete. So this is the coffee maker I use at home. Uh, so we built a mold upside down out of Legos, mixed the concrete, poured it in, waited two days, removed the Legos, and stuck in a glass funnel. And I have a, a very sort of Aztec ruin looking concrete coffee maker. Uh, this is a lounge chair I made in my house. This is the dog house I made for my friend's Frenchie. Let's see. Go ahead. And so, oh, this is a cool project. You know what zip ties are? Yeah. yeah. That's the best chair. So this is a chair. It's now in the Vitra Furniture Museum in Germany. And it's made entirely out of plywood and zip ties. There's no nails or screws. And the idea for it is that it was simply that. It's like, how do I make a chair without nails and screws? Zip ties are cheap, they're fast, they're really strong. And so I said, how do I connect wood with these things? Kept trying and experimenting. Once I found a way to connect the pieces, then I said, OK, now how do I design the chair? Uh, this is my, uh, so with design, most designers sort of two ways you can make a lot of money in design, right? You get really, really wealthy clients and or you design things for really, really wealthy people like like the people that consume like Prada or Gucci or these really expensive brands. And you work for com companies that design for high-end people so they can then sell things for a lot of money and then they can pay their employees a lot. Or you design really cheap stuff for the masses. So it's sort of be like if you were a chef, you either have like a really fancy expensive restaurant or you have like McDonald's, where you just, the stuff's cheap and terrible, but you just serve billions and billions of people. So I thought when I was designing for the low end of the market on YouTube that I wasn't going to get the sort of fancy options, right? I said, oh, I'm doing the McDonald's thing, I'm doing the Chipotle, the fast food thing, so that means I'm not going to get invited to the fancy parties and stuff anymore. The part I didn't figure out was social media influence. Because the thing that came with the designing at the low end of the market, affordable things and stuff like that, it also came with a lot of followers and media attention. So that actually was able to actually, I, what I, I thought I was giving up a set of opportunities at the high end, 
but it actually sort of added to them. So this is my friend Coco Rocha. She's a model. She's been on the cover of Vogue like 10 times. And she actually wanted the same stools for her home. So we shot a bunch of videos at her house. We showed her how to build it. Um, and she actually has the same $5 stools that everyone else does. So that's kind of cool, is that, yes? you sell those? No. Why do you think I don't sell them? Publicity. <laughs> exactly, right? It's like, I always want to have the competitive advantage, right? And it was a mistake I used to make when I was younger in business, is I would think, oh, I could make money, so I should do everything I can do to make money in all the different ways. What you, what you really have to do is you have to compare the way that you make the most amount of money in the least amount of time and ignore the ones that are considerably less than that. So yeah, I could sell those. But then I'd have to hire someone to ship them, I'd have to hire someone to make them, and I take capital risk, right? I have to pay for all the materials before and have them ready before somebody buys them. With media, I can make it once, spend $5 on the supplies, and then make thousands and thousands of dollars off of that video product, which I can just email or link or tweet out or tag in things. So it limits my risk and the margins are better. Let's see. So this is what I'm sort of doing now. This is the this is a small affordable robot that's in my uh, office. It's called a Uh, two things. I did consulting. Uh, consulting is 
when somebody pays you for what you already know. So I knew that, again, uh, I knew that I was younger, and I didn't have any work experience in architecture. But I looked at one guy, quiet, quiet, quiet. So the question was, is how did I make money in college so that I could start a business right afterwards? And I got consulting jobs. Consulting is where you get paid for what you already know, basically. So why would people hire like a student when there's professionals who've been doing it for a longer time? It's because I was purposely trying to find the things that I could study that were important to the world, but that people older than me hadn't figured out yet. So if you look at who all the sort of, this is kind of like a, so I think the equivalent now would probably be something like 3D modeling, social media, uh, short format video production, right? If you think about like, who, who, like the people that are best at producing fine videos, they tend to be on the younger side, right? Don't see a lot of like 40 year old people like becoming fine stars, right? So being young is sort of an advantage. Now where do those sort of skills of telling a whole story in six seconds really help? Commercials, marketing, right? So if you were like the example now, if you were really good at making vines and you want to figure out how you can make more money in college and just working at the campus bookstore, you'd be like, oh, I can produce videos. Video is really valuable. Every single brand that cares about marketing needs to produce video. And I'm good at making it, telling a whole story in six seconds. I can help them do that. You have a very marketable service. Whereas some 35-year-old that's in that sort of office, they've never made a vine before. They've maybe watched a few. They don't know how to like actually produce the content, and they don't have as much experience as you do in that specific type of media. So that's how you make more money than working in the campus bookstore, is you focus on the things that your generation knows how to do better than the older generations, but that the older generation needs to know. Anyone else? Yes. Um, have you ever fallen off those stairs? <laughs> Not yet. I got, I'm going to do a railing as one of my next projects coming up. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, probably the same thing, more plywood. Anything else? Any more questions? What side Jamaica Plank. Any other questions?